Welcome uh, to the 2024 edition of DAPX. I probably said DAPWORKS instead of DAPX in the previous <laughs> sentence. Um, the annual um, alumni conference, and I know it's great to see so many of you in the room. Welcome to all of you who are joining virtually. Um, others will be wandering in and out at, uh, uh, over the course of the afternoon. As always, we've got a really great lineup, and I was just saying this is one of the highlights of my year. Uh, just because I just get a reaffirmation of the value of ADAPT education, all of the wonderful directions that it can take you in this world. This year we've got maybe the widest ever spectrum of students in terms of graduating years. I think we've got a span of 56 years from the most recent to the, to, uh, to the oldest um, of the presenters today, and also just the diversity of practices. I mean, we've got a range from, you know, really established leaders in the field who are sort of paragons of sustained innovative practice, and on the other hand, we've got the young up-and-coming creatives that are showing us the possibilities for the future of our profession. Really heartened by both of these. I want to thank Al, uh, Ellen and the Alumni Association for again organizing this. I know that a lot of work goes into the to the preparation and the and the selection. Um, and I don't want to stand between you and one minute of this. So I will pass to our MC for the day, Brian Trainer. We had talked about him giving me walk-up music, and I was going to come down like Rocky, but my knees aren't participating. Hello, everyone. I'm Brian Trainer. I'm your uh, MC for today. I'm a DAP alumnus, award-winning race car driver, award-winning clogger, and president of the board of the Lebanon Theater Company in Lebanon, Ohio. And I only mentioned that because we have a show tonight, and I'm in it. So come see that. Um, I was part of the inaugural DAPX in 2019. And I'm thrilled to be back to introduce our speakers and help keep the day moving. And I'm even more thrilled to, be exper to experience DAPX with you, both online and in person. So that's why I'm going to stay in front of the microphone so that we have a really good hybrid experience. So, so much of the work that DAP, 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 DAP alumni do has a profound impact on human experience. And DAPX is our opportunity to celebrate our collective accomplishments. All of these presentations were self-submitted last fall as part of the annual RFP process, and we're very excited to learn more about each. To lay the groundwork, we're going to have five presentations back-to-back, -back, then we're going to take a short break, and then we'll do the second set of five presentations. So thank you for everyone uh, for being with us today, and we're going to get started. So first up is Scott Shaw. BS of ARC 98, he's presenting Building at the Edge, Reconstructing Design Practice Within Improvised Settlements. Um, and uh, I'm also, I should mention, I'm mispronouncer of names. So Scott, if I'm saying your name wrong, he's going to be online here. Scott Shaw, RA, is an Associate Professor of Architecture at Lawrence Technological University, founding principal of the architectural practice whom? Oh, it might be home, he can tell us, and the founding director of the International Design Clinic, a registered nonprofit that realizes socially responsive creative action with communities in need around the world. Since founding the IDC in 2006, Shaw has worked through this organization to complete over two dozen projects on five continents. Shaw's work in this area has been disseminated both nationally and internationally through publications, presentations, and exhibitions. Scott is joining us virtually today as he has a double header. Um, after presenting at DAPEX, he will be presenting at the National Conference of the Begin Beginning Design Student. So glad he could join us today and kick off the day. Scott, are you ready? I believe so. Scott, the audience is yours. Thank you. And thank you for the generous introduction. There aren't many pronunciations to be corrected, to be quite honest. Uh, there is perhaps one thing. I recently received word that I've been promoted to full professor, so their movement from associate to professor to full professor, and it is pronounced home. Um, home was, I recently established to leverage digital tools such as um, generative design uh, and digital fabrication tools to bring down the environmental and financial cost of housing. And we're currently building three homes based on that premise. I'd encourage you to go to the website and, and, and check that out. Uh, I am going to now go to my slideshow, though, because I'm painfully aware that my face is likely 30 feet tall. 
Uh, so let's move away from that. I will say that I wish I was there in person. As mentioned, I am double booked today, but I am I am just giddy to be here as a proud uh, alumnus of the of the program, uh, the architecture program of DAP and of the University of Cincinnati. So this is who I am. Uh, you can see there's some ways that uh, you might be able to uh, learn some more about my work uh, with home. And then today I will be speaking at length uh, about the International Design Clinic. Um, and let us start with the fact that in, let's see, in 1950, only 86 cities in the world held over a million people. Today, there are over 500. By 2030, there will be more than 650. Although some of this growth will occur within large cities, most will happen within second tier cities of developing countries, uh, resulting in the production of improvised settlements at a scale yet unseen. In my work, I have found that to meet the challenges and opportunities presented by this emerging world of rusted metal and blue plastic tarp, the designer must trade the rigid hierarchies embedded within patronage-based practice for more inclusive and hierarchical practices. They must abandon the linear research, then design, then fabricate, then use routine for approaches that overlap these activities in new ways. For in this place, a project site is more about persistent conditions than physical geography. Size is earned, not bestowed, and that small is okay. That use is not fixed, but will often emerge as new users reimagine, re-inhabit, or reconstruct the work. And that the permanence of architecture is negotiated, not guaranteed. To illustrate how I come to believe these tenets and how they manifest in my efforts, I will share a small selection of creative works that I've had the pleasure of completing with the residents of extra legal communities around the world. These projects were completed in cooperation with myriad partners, including the International Design Clinic, a registered nonprofit I established in 2006, so that I might co-create much needed creative work with communities in need around the world. Since its establishment, I have, as mentioned, through the IDC, completed over two dozen projects on five continents. One such project was in Mumbai, India. Now this work centered on a wonderful Indian nonprofit called Mumbai Mobile Crushes that ran schools on the construction sites of India. They did so because in India, it's often the practice of construction workers to bring their entire families onto the construction sites during construction. They create these improvised settlements that are surrounding the construction. And then when the condo is finished and wealthier families move in, they are kicked off the site, of course, and move to the next construction site. The children live on that construction site, creating a distraction for the parents and a danger to themselves. And so this group runs and goes to the people running the construction site and says, we'll run a school if you give us space. And often the answer is yes. Uh, it has benefits to all parties. And Mobile Mobile Crashes has had incredible success over the past couple of decades. They have now people teaching with them that were a part of their program 10, 20 years ago. They also have graduated people that have become lawyers and helped them in that capacity. Wonderful group reversing a cycle of inequity, which is really what we focus on. Now, to start this work, we first began by empowering those who knew the situation best to share their perspective. Right? Uh, we, we asked children at the school to draw their school. Uh, we armed them with disposable cameras and asked them to photograph some of their favorite things. We interviewed teachers. We observed the school day. We set up time-lapse cameras to document movement patterns, anything we could do to understand daily life within the crash. Now, from this, we came to understand that the most important issues facing these schools, at least to those working within them, had little to do with the architecture, at least as traditionally described. Not architecture as a whole, but more focused on individual aspects. This allowed us to start to create small works to address water-based illness, as you can see in the 99 cent water filtration device at the top, or sanitary places for evacuation, or uh, small playscapes uh, that the kids would have jurisdiction over and, and, and create little nooks for reading or sleeping or play, an, an opportunity they didn't have within the borrowed landscape that they normally inhabited. Now, the big lesson of this project is the architectural componentry and effects ran supreme, not the architecture, that it was a mandate for the admission of the impermanence of the architecture itself, something that would actually every two years be knocked down because the families moved off the construction site. And the transferability of things like lesson plans, furniture, items, other items of education. In fact, as an architect, it was my job in this project to remove as much of the pressure of the architecture itself that would be demolished and push it to things that could be transferred site to site. Things that 
Mumbai Mobile Crashes continues to use. Another such project started as a one-year partnership in Bolivia between the IDC and a group that ran arts-based educational program for kids living on the streets, including Alustrobota, as you see here, a shoeshine boy. They wanted us to help them expand their programming from their traditional Sunday festivals to something that could impact the kids throughout the week and provide arts-based education throughout the week. Now, to understand how we might approach this, we gathered the perspectives from everyone. We hired Luz Trabota to spend the day with us to tell us their stories, how they worked and lived. We used arts activities to understand the lives of the kids attending the events, used time lapses to understand movement patterns once again within the city, uh, charted every instance of marketplace within the city of La Paz. Um, you can see me in the fedora doing exactly that in the corner. Whether it was legal or illegal, it could be someone that just set out a blue plastic tarp and was selling He-Man toys, an actual instance, or someone that had a shop that was much more permanent. Now from this, we began to understand that any new architectural or educational program would need to be fit within the rigors of the lives of the children who do not have time to take a 45 minute bus ride across town to attend school for seven hours and then another bus ride home. They had to work. Their families were depending on it for food. So we started very small with a series of about 20 postcards, each of which offered a simple lesson related to arts programming and education. We subsequently printed thousands of these cards and started to distribute them, letting kids take them at these festivals. We observed which were popular and which the kids didn't actually care about at all to try to understand what topics within arts-based education actually meant the most to the children and how we could communicate these cards with color versus not color, the content. As these things circulated and the kids started to train them like Pokemon cards, there might be an instance up here somewhere of a card. I didn't put it in here, apologies. We took note and the things that demanded their attention, the things that they thought were important, we grew. You can see a couple instances here of a card. Uh, there's a picture there of a Lustrobota looking through a little experimental device that began to explain how the eye worked. You could see kids playing drums made with reclaimed PVC. A woman looking at something else that was talking about cameras. These were all topics that through our experiments became pretty important. The most important one though was music probably deeply embedded within the culture. And this gave birth to very large embodiments, such as you see here, based on the vending carts of the area. Now these could be installed throughout and were installed throughout the different uh, places of market, places that we had previously mapped, where they would open up and the kids would begin to use this to instruct their own lessons, to create games, which allowed our, our partners who worked on an all volunteer army basis to actually allow one volunteer to service three or four of these cards, expanding their reach. Because although volunteers are free, they're incredibly valuable. Now, something that interesting happened, although we focused on this one group and we were intending to stay there one year, word got out about what we were doing. And so we were approached by another group that uh, ran theater programming in the informal settlement of El Alto on the rim of the city. We, we were approached by a, a, a group that uh, provided opportunities for folks who did handicrafts to market their wares to other countries where they could actually get paid a decent rate for them. A, a group that helped to uh, provide educational and the culinary, or educational opportunities in the culinary arts for kids who were working the streets. And as these new partners came to us through the work, the work caused an expansion of our efforts. We ended up staying in Bolivia for five years continuing to work with these groups, continuing to generate work that still reverberates within the communities. The third project was completed in partnership with Mural Arts of Philadelphia, a nonprofit that installed murals across Philadelphia for decades, an amazing group. Now they were interested in the IDC using our unique methodology to help them to build a garden outdoor classroom around a recently completed mural in Bodine High School, which you can see here. Now we were immediately inspired by the fencing surrounding the school, the black fence you see at the bottom there. Well, the reason we were inspired is this is a public space. This is a public school. But yet the school found it necessary to erect a very large fence around this public space to keep people off the property because previously they were doing activities that the school didn't necessarily approve of. And we found this irony of a public space being so well protected to be an inspirational moment for us and wondered how fencing might become a thing that would draw people to the school rather than repel them. We also realized that the school was surrounded 
by vacant lots. And so we started to look in these vacant lots to try to find undervalued materials that could furnish an accessible medium for our response. The budget for the project was very, very modest, as you might imagine. And so we looked at these vacant lots and we noticed they were filled with broken bits of concrete, weeds, scraps of wood, and of course, fencing. To undercover utility with these materials, we adopted the approach of the bricolure conducting acts of hand-on experimentation using common tools and locally accessible methods. From this, we developed a number of innovations, including an approach to use common fence piping and 90-degree angles to create a more complex geometry that provided greater structural integrity and programmatic elasticity. You can see that at work in the final project here. Again, all these are 90-degree angles. You just change the plane of rotation so as to allow for greater strength within the piping. The final work provided all of the required spaces using undervalued materials and common tools. Every ounce of wood you see here was donated by the community or found within a vacant lot. Every bit of scrap that you see in this was, was given to us by projects and demolitions in the, in the area. We locally harvested them. More importantly, the final work successfully translated the fence typology from an element of exclusion to one of inclusion, from, from an element that repelled to one that welcomed. After completion of this project, the surrounding community approached the school to ask if they could use this formerly privatized public space to hold community events. They volunteered to help maintain the garden that would grow on these uh, on this fence posts. The whole thing became this kind of greenery or to expand the work itself. Now, the big lesson in this project is the bricolage basis, I think, and the, and the ability potentially of, of not relying on prescribed material types, but allowing hands-on experimentation to breathe new life into materials that well, were presumed not to have much use of all. And there's a transmittability of these practices that went on to inspire a lot of the IDC's future work, including this project in Africa. I took a team, a small team of about 11 students, faculty and professionals with backgrounds in architecture, design, and uh, engineering. And we worked in partnership with community members and, and created, over time, an event and maker space. Now, the space was constructed entirely from scavenged materials using only common tools and methods. The final project, uh, let's see, which you can see here under construction, um, the final project uh, was completed in less than seven days on a budget of $1,500. Uh, using almost entirely reclaimed materials. It has since reverberated throughout the community. Now, this work was a product of an intensely collaborative creative address based upon persistent and emerging situations, undervalued and indigenous resources. By, by, by so basing the work, our design team allowed it to align itself with the motivation, means, and methods of those in the community, ensuring that they would be empowered and well-positioned to possess and evolve the offered work long after we have left. For our partners who live and work within post-apartheid communities of great need, the rootedness and humble frugality of this project is not a nicety, but an essential attribute. For it is only through working within some limits that these works are able to shift from tantalizing one-offs to a physical and inspirational foundation through which our community partners might realize new works for years to come without our help. This is the final project, and since its completion, the tectonic approaches developed through this $1,500 makerspace have since been used in other projects by the community, allowing them to develop new schools, clinics, homes, and other works using primarily reclaimed materials at a fraction of the cost. This work has, has served an empowering function, allowing our partners to develop much needed work for less time, money, and support than previously possible, and to do it without any external support whatsoever. Now, the big lessons here are the propagation of empowering approaches within architecture. Approaches not necessarily manifest in the final physical form as an object, but in the processes by which it was made, the tectonics that might emerge from it, and the creative, creative new life breathed into these reclaimed materials, common tools, and local processes. The centrality of found and scavenged materials is hard to be overstated, but it doesn't, it's not exclusive, it's not monopoly anything undervalued could suffice. But the invention of shareable tech ta tactics, things that could be easily transferred from person to person 
it's hard to overstate the importance of that. Now, the most exciting part of this work is, is that it is propagating. Shown here is a residence designed by a member of the community based on the techniques I shared with you a moment ago. I was in the US when this happened. I had absolutely no role in this project. This is simply the architecture inspiring new architectures, more sustainable architectures, more affordable architectures of use to the community in a way that they describe and they create. And it's that kind of propagation seen in this project, another school done after the first project. It's that kind of propagation that if we're interested in creating a more sustainable future for, with the residents of extra legal settlements, it has to have that empowering function. We have to change our practice in order to serve those that need our services most. I don't believe this work is done and I'm excited to keep, keep at it. There's much yet, yet to understand. But after almost two decades, I find these glimmers of hope uplifting, uplifting myself and uplifting to the field that I've given myself to studying. And I'm excited to see what this might mean for the future. I thank you for giving me 10 minutes to share this work with you and I'm privileged to be a part of this thing. Thanks. Scott, thank you very much. Uh, good luck with your next presentation. I'm gonna give you a catchphrase, making the sustainable attainable. You can copyright that because it rhymes. As a consultant, we get to charge more for things that rhymes or anything that starts with the same letter. So there you go. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Scott. Our next presenter and our first in-person presenter good, uh, is Kyle Campbell, 2012 MARC. Uh, his presentation is named, I hope it's Mott's HQ. It might be Moats, but I knew some Moats's. Global Company Community Commitment. Kyle is a critical thinker with a thorough understanding of Champlin's design process and is primarily focused on creating spaces for worship and community-based clients that are artful, functioning, and uplifting. A strong believer in the power of story, Kyle strives to understand his clients at a deep level to ensure design reflects their narrative. His dedication to each client and project allows him to enjoy the fact that his work can positively impact countless lives. With his passion for research, Kyle leads Champlin's Research and Innovation Committee and works directly with student co-ops to create an engaging place to work. He is also a graduate of the Cincinnati AIA Vision Program and the Cincinnati Arts Wave Boardway Bound Program. In his free time, Kyle coaches his kids' soccer team. He was on the phone trying to find some people for tonight because some people were sick. So if you've got any girls that play soccer, talk to Kyle. Um, serves as the board of directors for the Art Academy of Cincinnati and the Friends of Music Hall. Please welcome Kyle. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I'm an architect, and uh, I believe that as architects, we're really storytellers. And I think that uh, when we are at our best, the stories are our clients' stories and not our own. And so um, we're never really the author of the work in the best situation. We're just the narrator. Um, and I'm here to tell a story about this client, which is Moats. So uh, it's not Mott's applesauce. It's um, Moats HQ. So this is a, a, um, a company that focuses on uh, high-performance athletic fields, which in and of itself is not my field of study, um, but I get to be a storyteller. So I worked with this client to help them understand. Um, and since I am telling a story and since I'm an architect, uh, architecture is my medium, and the characters of my story are things like stone, wood, glass, and steel. So because it's a story, I'm going to start with chapter one, which is humble beginnings. Um, so this company started in 1977 with one guy and a lawnmower. Um, and they quickly grew into a company that occupied a renovated church building, which is actually across the street. You can kind of see the gable of the roof of what was their headquarters here. Um, and so this was us walking the site before we ever did the interview or got the job. And we were wondering why would this global company want to take advantage of using this abandoned, nearly torn down, decrepit warehouse to be their new headquarters. Um, and so we started really diving into the story to understand why. Um, and so we looked at things like their purpose, what their mission was, and we realized that they are a, a company all about transformation, about transforming existing lives, about moving people to better lives. That's their mission statement. So from understanding their story to then translating that language, we understood um, <clears throat> that there was purpose behind buying an abandoned warehouse. 
Uh, they could have gone anywhere. They could have built anything from the ground up. They had the means to do it. Um, but again, they were, they're all about transformation. And so um, we began translating their story into a language that we could understand as architects and that they could understand as our client. Chapter two, becoming rooted. Um, so they were growing and <clears throat> getting rooted in their society, in their um, community of Newtown, Ohio, in the same way we wanted to do that. Again, this is all before the interview, before we had the job. Um, this is research about the client. And so really diving into who they were, their culture, uh, understanding the adjectives that kind of describe who they are, transforming that into activators or words that could help us begin to make that bridge between um, their story and a narrative that we could design that is their story. Uh, and then finally going into a design approach. And through all of that, we discovered a company that is really interested in making a mark. But again, they're, they're very humble. Um, and so the mark they wanted to make was not flashy and it wasn't big and it wasn't um, bold or anything that was sort of um, what we might consider high design. Uh, instead, so we, we landed on this concept of a furrow. So they, they work in the ground, they work in the earth, um, but a furrow is a mark nonetheless, and it is the place where seeds are planted, where ideas germinate, and where innovation happens. Um, and so that was kind of a driving force behind us to take to the interview. Um, and at the interview, uh, we approached them with this singular image. Uh, and again, this image was not one that was the solution. Um, so in 1989, they made the shift to high-performance fields from lawn maintenance, which was obviously a large shift. Um, and so what that told us is that they, they're always a company who's looking to think outside the box. Um, and so we approached them with the interview for the job with this image to say, um, this, is, this is a thought provoker. It's a conversation starter. Um, after all, we didn't know them. We hadn't even met them yet. We met their CFO who walked us through the building during the RFP process. Uh, and so when we came to the interview with this as a way to um, just engage in a conversation with them, it was an invitation for them to think bigger about office planning. Um, so they were doing this during COVID when everybody was shut down. That's when they approached us to build a new headquarters, which, as we all know, is a fantastic time to build a new headquarters when everybody is remote. Um, so there was an opportunity to think bigger about office planning to plan bolder and not think about office design in a conventional way, uh, but to look at different opportunities and then finally to organize better. Um, so about two thirds of their staff are field workers, people that are out building fields and constructing them, but they come back to the office for touch points. And they always up to that point had felt like outsiders um, within the company and not necessarily part of the community. And so we wanted to change that. Uh, moving on to producing fruit, the next chapter of the story. Um, shortly after that switch to high performance fields, uh, they gained global recognition very, very quickly. So uh, they went in 1996, um, they did the fields for the Atlanta Olympics, they picked up the Bengals, various Super Bowls, um, Sydney 2000, Beijing, and now they're pretty much any field that you've played on or experienced is likely a moats field or touched by moats. And so with this global recognition, um, that fueled their desire to really think differently and bigger about things while remaining humble. This background image looks like every architect's dream. It's just an endless floating plane. Um, but this is the reality of poor construction. So that abandoned building, when we did structural analysis, um, the CMU walls were not even um, reinforced to the minimum standard. There was no reinforcing at all in the building. Uh, they were crumbling, they were falling apart, but again, um, Joe Motes didn't want to tear out anything that wasn't necessary to tear out. So we were left with steel um, and a roof structure that caused us to think about design differently. Um, for them, materials and, and showing time and how the world evolves around them was very important. And so they wanted to think about how things like wood would weather, uh, how their materials would weather. And so we experimented with different rendering tools that show the timing effects of weathering on their materials and how they show um, a story amongst themselves. It's a very deep building um, with a, not a lot of natural light. Of course, when it's a floating plane, it is a lot of natural light. Um, but it was going to have walls at some point. And so we did a lot of analysis about sunlight and how we can bring light into their space because, after all, they're a company that works outside. And so how do you keep people connected to the outside through this process? 
Um, and then for us, it was an opportunity to do some experimental visualization to help them understand what, uh, what is the mood and tone and what do people feel and how do you create feeling and emotion with, with um, renderings and storytelling visualization. Chapter five. There aren't 20 chapters, there's only seven, so we're almost done. Um, chapter five is sowing seed. So <clears throat> as moats continue to serve their community and really get involved with moving people to better lives, um, they were motivated highly by sustainability. And so in 2009, they created this really big, important shift in sustainability because everybody thinks of artificial turf as essentially terrible for the environment and it's all stuff that gets thrown away and wasted. Um, and so Moats created these two products called environmental or Envirofill and Safe Shell, which are made from natural materials that can be ground up, reused, and recycled in their next fields at 100% recycled content. Um, and so that kind of innovative thinking and sowing seed about the future um, really drove our design process as well. So as we started working collaboratively with um, specialty contractors in both wood and steel, uh, we discovered that there's working as Moats does with innovative people, you have the opportunity to take things that are mundane like working construction drawings and those can end up telling beautiful stories about how things come together and so these drawings that, that look just as much artistic as they are um, construction documents became part of the construction set and how we start to talk about the story of construction and how things are built uh, in a way that can be beautiful even among the things that are mundane. Uh, chapter six, gathering harvest. So that brings us to 2021. Um, they earned Evergreen certification, which if you don't know, look it up. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about it, but uh, it is a challenging certification to earn. Uh, it's about overall sustainability and growth for a firm. Um, and this brings us to when they approached us to talk about this project. So for them, um, gathering harvest meant this idea of reuniting community. Uh, because again, their, their staff was all remote. They wanted to bring community back within the employees. They wanted to restore community within their neighborhoods and the people that live and work uh, around them. And they wanted to restore the notion of community with humanity um, amongst the global isolation of the pandemic. And so for us, the harvest that we gathered obviously was taking this client through a process of understanding their story and helping to narrate their story in space to create a spatial narrative of who they are and how they connect people to each other and back out to the communities in which they serve. Um, the final chapter, it's my favorite chapter, uh, I'm calling it Returning to Earth. Um, so this project was completed in 2023 and for us it was in many ways a returning to earth from this really far out alien anti-human concept of distancing, isolation, and caution. Um, and so they were very, very thrilled to have a place that people could call home. And I'm going to break the single one rule of presenting and actually read from the screen. Um, because this quote is important. So this is from their CEO, Zach Burns. Uh, and he said, the space we created has allowed for more advantages than simply bringing the team back together. We have opened our space for our customers to use for meetings and gatherings. Truly a win-win, they get to have a productive work session in a collaborative, inspiring environment, and we get to deepen our relationships with our valued customers. Another is the adjacent property we gifted, a brand new synthetic turf field to a local community church. Moats' purpose is moving people to better lives. In addition to showcasing our most recent technologies right outside our front door, this means that now we can look at how out the window every day and see our purpose in action, 100 children playing on the field. The lesson we see in this story is that the best way we found to bring our team back together in person was to create a space that exemplified and embodied our values. We built a space that invites a culture that people want to be a part of. The rest is falling into place, our place. And so this was an article that was uh, about their reopening of their new headquarters. Um, and what's interesting to me is um, the powerful thing is that there's no mention of Champlin architecture in this. And uh, to an architect's ego, that can look like a slap in the face. Um, but if we are at our best, and our stories are truly about our clients, um, then something like this is a profound triumph, in my opinion. 
Um, because it is, they should tell their story. The building should be about them. It should be their story. Uh, and when a client takes complete ownership over a project that we design for them, and they think of it as theirs, as their culture, as their people, uh, then I believe that we have succeeded in the highest degree possible. And I think that's a really beautiful story. Um, and who knows? Maybe this story will inspire other stories as we all work together in the great human narrative. And that is it. Thank you. Nice job, Kyle. Thank you. Thank you very much. Still beat 10 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> as an award-winning race car driver, excellent time. That's right. Um, yeah, thank you. That was, I, I like that. If you tell a good story, people see themselves in it. And the more people take ownership of that story, I think that was very well done. Thank you, Kyle. Um, our next presenter, Ron Paul Baum, class of 71, BS ARC, is doing a presentation called Arts and Crafts Continuum, Emerging Creative Land Use Project. Uh, Ron Paul Baum is the designer and facilitator of the Arts and Crafts Continuum, a creative land use project and topic of his talk. Throughout his career, Ron's work has centered on the intersection of art, activism, and placemaking. Beginning with his work as a housing specialist in the Walnut Hills neighborhood in Cincinnati, to serving the Sammamish Valley Alliance Management. Ha, you thought you'd get me with Sammamish, didn't you, Ron? Guess what? I worked for Bon Marche. I know where that is. Sammamish Valley Alliance Manager and founding the Windows Art Gallery in Seattle, Washington. Our next presenter is Ron Paul Baum. Ron, the audience is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, get my screen started here. Very glad to join you all here supporting this timely creative process. Learning the plight of industrial revolution workers, anticipating the plight of artificial intelligence revolution workers. Magnetic blackness brushes by an almost silent critical analysis, interacts and transforms to address deep and wide poverty and war. Objectively abstract modernist woodblock carefully carved with a very sharp pocket knife under the eye of John Peterson. Seductively subjective postmodernist woodblock carefully reconsidered as cellular growth at the dawn of a silent spring. William Morris writes and prints a conscientious objection to the plight of industrial revolution workers in the heart of the British Empire. We are stardust, we are golden, billion-year-old carbon caught in the devil's bargain. Ernst Abbey and Carl Zeiss organized their optical works into the world's first cooperative perpetual purpose trust. Hermann Schneider designs UC cooperative education and influences 1930s Bauhaus. William Morris and friends create Red House and inspire the English arts and crafts movement. Danny Ransahoff's Over the Rhine Poverty Lecture inspires alternative military service as Walnut Hills Housing Advisor. Cincinnati Cooperative Education Plan inspires Antioch Cooperative Education Plan. Highlander School trains 1930s labor, or, labor union organizers and 1950s civil rights organizers. How many roads must a man walk down? Friere and Horton together answer, we make the road by walking. Creatively sharing housing, scrounging meals, living artfully, happily fighting war peacefully. Conscientious objection to militarism and materialism, carefully reconsidered as conscientious, co-creative cooperation. Form follows function, paradoxically reconsidered as function follows form. A new day, a new way, and new eyes to see the dawn now witness the quickness with which we get along. An architect is one member of a family of 500 back to the land homesteaders. Home of the red idea bubble people, 
from the group machinery sketch on acres of bountiful, sustainable, green, and wild mother nature. Path, porch, and door, living, kitchen, and dining, and back porch steps to get ourselves back to the garden. Space capsule home with stadium center stage, surfaced with 500 individual privacy meditation pods facing out into nature. Imagine the creative life of a young apprentice with equitable access to these affordable resources. What conditions would allow art to emerge gracefully, joyfully, dramatically, perpetually. How might an arts and crafts continuum plan work today on debt-free land? By adjusting only a very few fundamental economic principles. A perpetual purpose stewardship equitable community emerges from a profitable real estate property rental business, allowing creativity to grow naturally from the quality of life. What are these arts and crafts continuum principles? Prohibit debt. Community property must be perpetually free and clear. Community capital must be retained in perpetuity by prohibiting sale. Recirculate profit. Transition from sole proprietorship, maintenance and improvement to collaborative stewardship. Encourage equitable trade, affordable fees and income generations for stewards. Support apprenticeships, stewardships and creative cooperation. And the beautiful inspirational outcomes Without inflationary debt burden, user fees become increasingly attractive. Without sales, transaction expenses, the system becomes progressively affordable. Recycled profits to maintenance and improvements make resources more desirable. Diverse gatherings of stewards begin managing and maintaining resources artistically. Cooperative stewardship and apprenticeship opportunities build a positively creative alternative. Steward sharing and enjoying the advantages of cooperation continue gifting and growing the arts and crafts continuum. Quotes from the quotes and images from the arts and crafts stewardship tool library informing the creation and continuation of collaborative apprenticeships. The past is not dead, it is living in us and will be alive in the future, which we are now helping to make. The teacher is of course an artist. What the educator does in teaching is to make it possible for the students to become themselves. Instead of thinking that you put the pieces together that will add up to a whole, I think you have to start with the premise that they're all ready together. And you try to keep from destroying life by segmenting it, over-organizing it, and dehumanizing it. Our guiding principle was that design is neither an intellectual nor a material affair, but simply an integral part of the stuff of life necessary for everyone in a civilized society. I do not want art for a few any more than education for a few or freedom for a few. I give institutions and structures and traditions all the respect that I think they deserve. They have to earn it by serving people. Nothing will change until we change, until we throw off our dependence and act for ourselves. The true secret of happiness lies in taking a genuine interest in all the details of daily life. Be ashamed to die until you have won some victory for humanity. Words are often as important as experience because words make experience last. Those who refuse to share their knowledge with other people are making a great mistake 
because we need it all. Knowledge emerges only through invention and reinvention, through the restless, impatient, continuing, hopeful inquiry human beings pursue in the world, with the world, and with each other. Three elements go to make up an idea. First, its intrinsic quality and feeling. Secondly, the energy with which it affects other ideas and energy which is infinite in the here and nowness of immediate sensation, finite and relative in the recency of the past. And thirdly, the tendency of an idea to bring along other ideas with it. The entire universe is perfused with signs. If it is not composed exclusively of signs, a whole range of possibilities, a continuum. We sincerely need your questions. Please experience windowsart.com as part of a continuing conversation. Thank you very much. Ron, thank you very much. I, I don't know if it was your intent, but for a while there, that felt like a meditation, and I was into it. Um, but I liked it. That was, <laughs> that was pretty relaxing. I could listen to that on a loop um, every night and feel inspired. But it sounded to me like the best way for art to thrive is to mitigate the burden of finance. I don't know, may, I might be oversimplifying some of what you were saying, but I thought that was fascinating. So thank you, Ron Paul. Our next presenter is Joe Walsh, uh, 2015 BSDE with the presentation, Drawing Leads the Way. Joe Walsh is an artist who works in comics, illustration, animation, and design. He recently received an Individual Excellence Award from the Ohio Arts Council for his animation work on Why We Walk, an award-winning documentary that has screened at over 25, 25 film festivals worldwide. Some of Joe's past work includes updating the iconic sign for Cincinnati's Shake It Records with eight painted portraits and self-publishing two books of drawings, 14 Days of Drawing and River Road. Um, Joe is current, 14 Days of Drawing, and River Road. There we go. Thanks. Um, Joe is currently working on his first comic, The Shifting Ground. Joe is also one half of Take a Moment Studio, an ongoing collaboration with John Flannery of Cryptogram. Uh, Take a Moment Studio creates one-of-a-kind posters by combining screen prints with hand-drawn illustration. Please welcome to the stage, uh, Joe Walsh. There you go. Thank you. I forgot how much of my presentation I spoiled in the intro, but uh, <laughs> uh, my name is Joe Walsh, graduated in 2015 from graphic design, but I'm mainly here to talk about drawing. Uh, starting with as we all did. I drew all the time as a kid, and I had two artistic parents uh, and an older sister, so I was like given lots of media to take in and I, if you ask my parents I was happy to sit there and read those books and draw and I had to be kind of pulled away to do much else which is still pretty much the case uh, this is kind of a circular story of how I went out into the world and came back basically to this place uh, as a kid after my some of my uh, the influence that were coming from my family I had all that but I started to develop my own interests at this place shake it records I don't know if you've all been there it's a north side and I went there for music, but I sl quickly discovered that they had this amazing comic section. And uh, shout out to this guy named Joe Kuth who puts that all together. He changed my life without ever knowing me until recently. But uh, <laughs> anyway, I discovered a lot of cartoonists who turned out to be a lot of my favorite artists, like Carol Tyler and Dan Klaus and Justin Green, who actually did the sign for Shaker Records and often would display his work there. Anyway, he'll come back to him later. Uh, here's proof uh, that I spend all my money there still to this day. These are all comics for the most part, and we'll come back to that later too. Uh, my teenage years, I did a lot of artworks projects, so I worked on many of the murals around town. This is my favorite one uh, that I worked on. It still looks great to this day somehow. Then I went to DAP. <laughs> a lot more things happened, but I wanted to get to the later work. So I went to DAP, but I kind of went in with this feeling of, basically wanting to be an artist, but knowing that DAP was 
a good place to go. <laughs> so I went in with that kind of mindset and I did sort of struggle against concepts like the one Kyle was talking about earlier of good design being invisible and that you're not really, that you're a problem solver and not a, you know, artist in that way. It's more about like getting through the airport without realizing you didn't get lost and that sort of thing, which I love and I appreciate to this day. But I did struggle against it as someone who likes to draw and express themselves that way. I made all my projects in DAP into drawing projects, like an infographic project became an animated music video, things of that nature. And I really enjoyed that struggle of, you know, finding my way. Uh, but of course, I learned a lot of great things about type and design and just like ways to, you know, communicate your visual beyond just a drawing in the middle of a sketchbook page or that sort of thing. Sorry. Uh, but the other thing that's great about my time at DAP is the internships. I got to live in San Francisco and New York and try out jobs that I may have just gotten right out of school and not, you know, known any better kind of, you know what I mean? So I got to try out jobs in architecture and sustainability and I also worked for this guy uh, who's a mysterious artist who doesn't show his face <laughs> and this guy's name is Kenzo and he has a company called Kenzo Digital Immersive that does these kind of tech uh, art immersive experiences some of which you can see here there's one that's LeBron James in one of them and uh, it works for companies like Samsung and Bacardi and whatnot and I just wanted to mention him up front because I still work for him to this day, and he's a great relationship that I developed through my time at DAP. Um, but it's different than a lot of what I'll be showing you. So this is an observation deck in a new skyscraper in New York, which we worked on pitching together. And it's kind of like a kaleidoscopic, uh, you know, kaleidoscope in the sky. It's like 58 floors up uh, looking over Manhattan. But anyway, so I just want to bring him up early because I'm not going to really talk about him again, but he is somebody that I still work with to this day. So fresh out of college, I started to do freelance design work. Um, I would always incorporate animation and texture whenever I could. And these are just some album covers I did for friends bands. Um, I did early on in my career, I submitted a design to the 20th anniversary cover of Infinite Jest, which is like my favorite book at the time, and a postmodern gigantic classic of over a thousand pages about addiction and media and all this stuff. It's a great book. I'd recommend to anyone, but uh, it was a crazy first project out of school because I submitted, and then like six months later, they told me I won, but I wanted to bring it up also because it starts my chafing with clients because... <laughs> It shows the thing on the left is what I submitted and won the contest with, and the thing on the right is what was printed after we made a few changes. Uh, but once again, drawing leads the way. We got the drawing maintained, the main central image. I'm still very proud to be a part of the lineage of that book, but it did kind of, should have been a red flag. Um, anyway, <laughs> then I settled into being a freelance designer and illustrator. I took kind of comfort in the term designer as a catch-all that allowed you to do this large range of creative projects under the guise of professionalism and legitimacy that artists doesn't quite give you out in the world. Uh, but as you can see, I still did everything by hand. Um, these are some just examples of projects I enjoyed. Uh, you don't see a lot of fonts working <laughs> in my work. I also started peddling my wares, so I would, as a creative outlet and as a just kind of different uh, you know, outlet for my work and for money as well. I started to sell things at craft fairs and art book fairs. I made some hyper-specific Cincinnati pins, such as the Touchdown Jesus sculpture when it was struck by lightning and the, the uh, Camp Washington salt dome, <laughs> things like that. But uh, I got really, started to get really into print and that sort of old school version of design, I guess, essentially. And while chafing against the constant struggles of working as an independent person, working client-facing, did a lot of teaching people how to, how to treat a designer, <laughs> taking it straight to the face. Uh, I did, I always wanted to have these projects that were just kind of, just about drawing and a reason to, you know, center that again. So I did this book, which is a book of um, 
kind of visual my idea was visual eavesdropping so like going to places every day for two weeks in a time when i didn't have a car and uh drawing people in those spaces so uh just drawing straight with pen no no pre-sketching i did cheat by going to some seated events it's a little easier to draw people at those uh this is a much later project but i wanted to show it in this part because it doesn't fit anywhere else this is a recent book of drawings i did with a friend named evan varelli and it's the both of us drew from the east to west towards each other on River Road and passed and kind of created this double-sided book of observational drawings of the city. Um, anyway, so in the, you'll notice that the client work goes away and it's more, my focus became more about how do I just draw all the time and uh, through that, kind of putting that out into the world, I met people such as John Flannery who can't quite tell how tall he is in this, but you can in the next. He's a very tall local screen printer uh, and designer himself. And we started a project called Take a Moment Studios, which you can kind of see on the right, the process. It's like a two-man collaboration where John does a layer of screen printing through a paper mask so he can cut a new image every time. And then he hands that off to me and I do a layer of drawing. And we just kind of do these like afternoon, evening long sessions where we make as many posters as we can started as kind of an art for all uh, idea meets a way for us to kind of go to the gym creatively or whatever and just work quickly, work large. Um, you know, there's ink drying on the screen, so you have to, there you can see his height there. Uh, <laughs> so you have to keep it moving. Uh, and we've given out thousands of these posters over the years. At one point we had a residency at the Contemporary Arts Center, which was like a dream because we were there twice a week for four hours each time and just whoever came out of that elevator was our, you know, collaborators and whatever. And it's, it's, it's something I still do to this day and I love it. Some of my favorite work. Shout out to John. Okay, so these are just some other examples of illustrations and design work that I'm proud of from this time. Uh, but I'm definitely at this time, we'll say we're at 2018, 2019 at this point, I am like drowning in word of mouth recommendations of new work to be done and it's all kind of something I already agreed to a year ago and now it's, for, now it's coming up and I'm just kind of like really struggling with that whole thing. As anyone in the room is a freelancer, you'll know that it's, you have to do all the jobs. Um, quick, quick side note. This is a recent project that I still do some of this stuff, but uh, I was proud of this work for Colette, which is a great new restaurant in town. So in 2020, I declared I'm an artist now. <laughs> and this was mainly a semantics uh, thing for me to feel better, but uh, it was also kind of the beginning of a shift towards kind of just going all in on personal projects and whatnot. But like I just mentioned, I was always um, had committed to something years ago. And something that I was committed to that I was, was excited about was this film, Why We Walk. Uh, and uh, this was an example of me wanting to do animation. <laughs> um, so I wanted to, I'd always done animated loops and things like this for clients and put it in there whenever I could. But this was a chance to like really tell a story with it. These are kind of just flashes of various different scenes. Um, but it's a film about walking and about these three guys here who started a walking crew in Cincinnati. They live, they came from, uh, one guy came from the Congo, one guy escaped a civil war in Ethiopia as a kid, but they all uh, centered on Cincinnati and it's kind of like about their story and there's more to it, but I'm gonna move on. But like they said in the intro, it's shown at a bunch of film festivals and it was recently uh, purchased for distribution, so it should be more widely available soon, which I'm very excited about. Okay, so along, somewhere along those ways, I met Justin Green, the guy who did that shake it sign that I was like the carnival ride into all my interests as a kid. And he's an underground comics legend, moved here later in life and became a uh, sign painting legend, essentially. Any cool hand-painted sign in town was probably Justin. Uh, we met on this project. I don't feel like there's much time to talk about, so I'm gonna move on. but. Through my work with him, I was reconnected with, as you can see, old school ways of just using the dip pen, illustrating. I was reconnected with comics as a tangible thing to do. And he also kind of bequeathed slowly the Shake It Records sign job on me, uh, which was a dream. And I did these eight new portraits, uh, which you can see here 
were installed and we did a whole refresh of the sign. And this was kind of like the peak of, I don't know, Cincinnati client-based freelance work for me. I almost felt like I can move now. Once I did this, I didn't move. But uh, this is like a, it's hard, I don't know if I conveyed it well enough, but this is kind of a culmination of a lot of my interest in life and it's really an honor that I was able to work on this. Fortunately, before it was even fully installed, Justin Green passed away and it's a shame that he wasn't around to see it, but it was an honor that he kind of like let me do that. Uh, anyway, so through Shake It, through Justin, through not wanting to do uh, client work as much, I started to work on this project called The Shifting Ground, which is a comic book that I'm currently working on. I've got some imagery here of it. Um, and it's something that I'm definitely using my design knowledge I learned from DAP um, in the kind of color separations and the page designs. And um, I think it's the best stuff I've ever done. It's kind of the only, <laughs> I don't know if other designers feel this way, but there's the negative side of the design invisible and even being an illustrator for other people's projects, you start to kind of feel like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know if this is creative. And this has been a chance to like actually tell a story for the first time of my own. And it gets pretty intense. And so these are some intense ones. But I'm sure there's some goofs in there too. Uh, I'm going to read this because I got here. I'm probably past 10 minutes now. But uh, how strange it is to be alive during your own lifetime and legacy or lack thereof to be working on the early work that will influence the later work, Looney Tunes anvil dangling above. It just has to truly not matter if anyone cares. It's a dance with life itself, or God, or whatever. Anyway, uh, <laughs> there's uh, also a subplot that happens in the uh, gym steam room, and that one is uh, just based on the actual flagrant things that people do in the steam room, such as burn sage while doing hundreds of sit-ups and making loud breathing noises. Uh, but anyway, uh, <laughs> I was all circling back around. This is me now. I put my art out of the art hole, and, and hopefully you like it. And it kind of circles back. As an adult, I draw all the time. And yeah, <laughs> thank you. I think that's the best ending of a presentation ever. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Um, our, it was interesting to say, you know, we, I don't know how many other people have experienced that, but one of the things that DAPDEX brings out is what you thought you were going to school for. Sometimes that passion pulls you back and you wind up doing the thing that you wanted to do in the first place, or you go in a completely different direction that surprised you, uh, but you find you know, your joy that way. Um, our fifth presentation for the morning before we take our break, uh, Valerie Allen, class of 75, BFA, and Armin Mersman with their presentation, Time to Inspire, Create, and Grow. Valerie Allen received her BFA from University of Cincinnati. She is a lecturer for Golden Artist Colors, co-founder of the podcast Art Ladders, The Creative Climb, curator, mentor, and maestrious art community and art educator. Valerie has exhibited nationally, including the Chicago Biennial, New American Drawing Santa Fe, National Collage Society, New England, and Site Brooklyn, New York. In 2022, Valerie received the Great Lakes Bay All Area Artist Award for her role as a visual artist and community leader. Armin Mersman is well known for his intense naturalistic graphite drawings, but also works in photography and digital art. His artistic entrance interests have become more experimental in recent years with more attention placed on the surfaces of the artwork. He has won major awards throughout the United States. Mersman is a curator and art educator. He is co-founder of Arts of Art Ladders, the Creative Climb podcast, and mentor for Maestrius Art Community. Please welcome Valerie and Armin. Thank you. Welcome. Good to see you. Well, here we are, and I want to welcome you to Art Ladders, The Creative Climb. We're a visual arts podcast for artists and art lovers, 
And we are six, 68 episodes strong right now, and we've been doing this since 2021. I'd like you to take a look at our palette of colors that we operate under. We're operating under connection, community, and commitment. Our episodes range from subjects such as the healing power of art to time management for artists. And we actually had Cal Collin in the room for one of our podcast episodes on collaboration and community. It's episode 36 when you go back and listen to our podcast. We're going to start with a couple of uh, excerpts from our top 10 episodes of our list. And this is a British artist, Sally Hurst. Sally Hurst is a very energetic and very generous artist in explaining her process. She's very big on Instagram, lots of followers. And here you're going to hear her talking about her um, process in her art. It's become increasingly abstract over the last a uh, few years, but it's still very much based on reality. So I still go out and take lots of photographs. I still do sure. lots of drawing. I still explore all of the visual aspects of what I'm doing. And then I just grab the bits that I want to take a bit further. And I do that in lots of ways, either literally grabbing and like zooming in with a small viewfinder on a small area and abstracting and taking away things I find interesting uh, or chopping up and combining mm -hmm. uh, different people. And, but the, the, the root is always, is, they're always from the same place. They're always from the sketchbooks, they're always from a realistic, you know, a, a, a point of view, really. Um, and, and, and then it's about exploring different media. And I, I, I love, playing with media uh so i i do a, i do printmaking and i do painting and i paint on my prints and i cut up my paintings and i'll put the painting through the press and you know <laughs> everything everything just gets reworked and reworked and and this kind of um cross pollination mm -hmm. uh of different techniques and different media and the 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 prominent thing is well what if you know yeah. What if I did that? So curiosity is 100%. Uh, next, we have uh, a friend, a mentor, and a former teacher, Larry Butcher. He's going to talk about his early years of being an art professor. My painting class had 12 people. By the end of the semester, I only had three. Those three, I sat down and I critiqued them and I said, I'm going to give you all A's, all three of you for surviving. But really only one of you is worth an A. <laughs> and anyway, they left. And then Charles took me aside and he says, Larry, where are you? And I thought, well, maybe this is some kind of Zen question. Where are you? Uh, well, I'm right here. I'm right here right now. He says, that's right. You are at Delta College. You are not at Cranbrook Academy of Art. <laughs> These are people who are not graduate students. They are students who are coming with varying degrees of abilities and backgrounds, and you need to teach each one of them because they all paid the same amount of money to come and be in your class. That was the huge whack in the face of who I needed to be as a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, and so what really changed for me was uh, know your students. So I would do lessons that they would reveal themselves in, and then I would use them to pry more out of them. Uh -huh. And over the years of teaching, I decided the best I could say I am is that I'm a gatekeeper, a gateway to their new artistic life. Mm -hmm. And I can give them every tool possible for them to know themselves so they can walk through that gate and be, them, be themselves. And that if I do the fundamentals right, it's a community college, if I lay the foundation right, they can build anything they want. Yeah. And so with that in mind, that's how I taught. And I knew that they went out of there with as many, depending on their own abilities, but if they would do the lessons and involve themselves in that community that would happen with my, my classes, because that mattered, that I could build a community where they knew each other, 
because they would critique each other, because they would share materials with each other, or they would all be comrades in a common struggle of a tough lesson. Mm -hmm. um, but that community would make them strong enough that they could they could do what they needed to do, even if they never took any more classes. And then the other thing with a community college is I would have in a classroom an 18-year-old, a 20-year-old, a 30-year-old, a 40-year-old, oldest student was 80. Mm -hmm. And I almost blew it with her asking this kind of benign question, because she's 80. Uh, well, what were you doing a year ago? She says, oh, I was in Micronesia with the Peace Corps. Yeah. Oh, so this podcast that, that we've been working on since 2021, it started out as coffee conversations in our kitchen. And Armin and I would talk for hours, mm -hmm. you know. And I was the abstract artist in the group. And, no, I was a realist. And you were the course, realist. Yeah. And we'd argue back and forth. And it, we took we that show. We never argued. We, you know, we, well, we, we heavily discussed. <laughs> yeah. We took that show on the road and started doing these crazy talks and uh, how two creatives work as a, as a couple. And um, we landed on, on this. So um, this particular episode is in our top 10, and it's, it's a conversation that he and I have together. And it's called Hold the Vision, Trust the Process. These um, situations, these Zoom meetings that we have with the interviewees and, and with ourselves, we never, none of us think we're going on video. So, you know, the last one's kind of kind of crazy. So I grabbed those little uh, sound bites for you today. But here we go. On how to put yourself first as an artist. You go. Well, to put yourself first as an artist, you know, I say this to all my students, have a place to do art. Yeah. Have a sanctuary. Yeah. That's not always practical, you know. I mean, when, when I was in my 20s, we lived in a trailer, and, you know, I had a corner that was my sanctuary. But have that sanctuary where you don't have to deal with kids and dogs and husbands and wives and, and all those kinds of things. And let yourself, let yourself fantasize uh, about your art and, and your vision, right? That's the first thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also, have a vision, not that you want to be an artist, but have the vision that you are an artist. Excellent. Right? Yes. That doesn't mean everything is going to be hanging in the Louvre, you know? Right, right. So what I'm saying is, what you create is unique. You said that in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Everybody did this unique painting. Uh -huh. So, you know, there's no, there is no magic line when all of a sudden you're an artist. No. No, no I don't remember that. Okay, yeah, I was I was 31. The banner I, I, came out. I also never became an artist. Mm -hmm. I still sometimes that that word sticks in my throat when I say, "What do you do?" I'm an artist. You know, that's my own problems. But you know, there is no magic time when you are or are not an artist. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a word you can't define. That's like love. You, mm -hmm. know, you can't define it. You can write wonderful poetry about it. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So you know. Think of yourself as an artist. Don't try to become what your teacher is doing. Mm -hmm. If you have a good teacher, they're going to help you become what you do. What become. you do. Right. Yes, they're bringing out the best in you. Yeah, they want to have to understand you. They want to see where you're going and what you think, and they help you along the way. That's the way I look at it as a teacher and as an artist. Mm -hmm. um, there's days I feel like I'm a hell of an artist. There's days that I'm like, I fool the world all the time. Oh, Sock. yeah. Oh, yeah. That imposter thing. Yeah, we talked creeps about up. that in the past. But we have. Then, you know. It bears repeating. And what about you? And tips that I treasure what you do as an artist for artists, I say, and you basically said it love yourself. You are doing important work. Mm -hmm. Students of art, artists, you know, uh, mid-career, advanced artist, you are giving so much to this world that it's hard to even put a value number on it. The world needs artists. We need people that think creatively. We need people to bring things into existence that have never been here before. It gives me chills to think about all the wonderful artworks that have come before in history mm -hmm. that we now 
pay homage to. And it definitely gives me chills. So self-love, you are doing something wonderful for this world. So that is my huge tip to an artist. You are jumping off the cliffs. You are hang gliding over <laughs> all this territory. Mm -hmm. You are the daredevils. Yes. Okay. So we hope you uh, listen to our podcast. We're out there on Apple Podcast and Spotify. We're very passionate about these episodes. And yeah, we're on Instagram, Facebook. You can find us. Armin? Yes, thank you for, for listening and uh, stay curious, stay creative, and uh, I'll be seeing you on our podcast. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> And See, this way it gets done right. There. Don't let me touch it. Thank you, Valerie and Armin. I don't know if um, Joe had listened to your podcast before, but he already thinks of himself as an artist. I, I like how those linked up. Um, our next presenter is virtual presenter. Uh, we're going to welcome Hal Apple, uh, class of 82. BSDE with this I, I'm so curious about this. The title of his presentation is called Women Seriously. Um, Hal Apple is an expert in branding, design, and improving workflow experiences. He ran a successful design practice before working at Disney, Amgen, and other companies where he partnered with, college, uh, with colleagues in around 50 countries. He is a caregiver for his wife's uh, hyphen physician and edits, designs, and publishes the books she authors. And, as you will learn from his talk, is inspired by her work. Outside of his professional life, Hal enjoys growing lemon trees, volunteering, studying, writing, and nurturing close friendships. We welcome Hal and his video presentation. Hal, the audience is yours. Hi. Welcome, everyone, and thanks, Brian. Yes, my presentation is entirely by video, so it's going to be on time. And it's provocative, hopefully. So I welcome further conversation. If any of you would like to talk to me about the presentation, the best way is to reach me through LinkedIn. So Dan, you want to go ahead and run the video? Women. Seriously? Hi, I'm Hal Apple. I grew up in Columbus, Indiana, influenced by branding from Paul Rand, Architects like Edward Larrabee Barnes, I.M. Pei, Harry Weiss, sculpture by Henry Moore, and protection by Fire Station No. 4, thanks to Robert Venturi. Me and my small hometown were influenced by dozens of architects and artists over a period of 40 years, and none of the commissions ever went to women's. I studied design at the University of Cincinnati. Later, I went on to design the happiest rooms on earth, and learned much about life-saving medical treatments. Recently, I designed a book, Forgive to Live, written by my doctor and my wife. Medical school taught doctors about human anatomy and physiology by using a male body as the standard and norm. Entire organ systems studied primarily by referencing the male body. The female body was introduced as having the different reproduction system as if women have aberrant organs. This book changed my life, unlike most of our projects where we hope that they might influence others. How do we measure success? Is it by A, how many awards that we win? B, the design brief was fulfilled? C, the project was on time and on budget? Or is it D, nobody died from a result of the project? except that women are much more likely to die in a car crash than men. In fact, all crash test dummies used by the DOT up until 2012 were based on the male physique. And then they introduced a four foot, 11 inch female crash test dummy. That's the fifth percentile of all women. As my dad would say, that's a Mickey Mouse idea. Good idea, let's try testing with Mickey. Yeah, come on, get out of there. Yeah. Can we take women seriously, please? Let's design better seating. Five foot four is the average height of a woman in the US. 
not 5'9", which seems to be about the average height of the person that we design our chairs for. And then we have shrink it and pink it. It's a common design solution described by the author of Invisible Woman and by Karen Corellis Ruther, a designer, former Nike executive and Harvard fellow. Karen notes that military boots are a cause of injury for many women serving our country. The military simply shrinks the boots that were designed for men and make them fit for women. Do we treat our own colleagues fairly? About half of all graphic designers are women. Great. But about 89% of all creative directors are men. And as one female designer said, it is the female creative directors who have helped to shape not only my career, but who I am. Fashion designers who are women earn on average $20,000 less per year than men. What about fine art? Well, sales of female artists represent just 2% of the entire fine art market. And of this 2%, 40% is done by only five women. At Oxford University, Dr. Renee Adams is widely recognized as a global expert in finance and management and the emerging financial impact of gender bias. She gave a remarkable research presentation at the Art Students League of New York, and her team analyzed 1.9 million paintings auctioned and sold. The women's paintings sold for about 40% less than men's. Paintings done by women are valued less, particularly among people who are well-educated, wealthy, and well-versed in art. That's most surprising. It's not a coincidence to me that most people buying art, museums included, her research shows, purchase art that is primarily produced by men. Let's head over to industrial design. About 19% of industrial designers are women in the US, but only 11% of the leadership positions are held by women. Oh, and architecture. Well, about half of those who graduate from architectural programs are women. But only 15% of all licensed architects are women. What happened to all of the other women? Is there a problem here we need to solve? I was taught in design school that every design project is actually a problem to solve. And us men, we love to hear about a problem to solve. But, but men, first we need to understand that our confidence is not equal to competence. I've been thinking about maybe five things that we could do. One is redesign our creative briefs. One author writes that we can reframe our problems by diversifying the framers. The emerging field of customer insights changed much of how we do our work. Why can't we do the same with our work? By asking colleagues or people beyond our own disciplines to randomly review our creative briefs and our, even our proposals by using their standards, not ours. The second thing we can do is redesign how we hire, promote, and retain staff. Years ago, when I owned my own design firm, I chose not to promote Charlene from office manager into business development and a client services role. Instead, I chose Chuck. I used the wrong standard of measurement because I was looking for the most qualified. So. Chuck was fired after three months because I used the wrong standard of measurement. Here's what I used. Experience and industry reputation. Well-spoken and confident in performing the job. How quickly will they be successful in the role and proven ability to write design briefs? A better standard of measurement is hiring the most valuable person. These are the criteria I should have used. Humble, humble in attitude, passion. Charlene was our office manager and passionate about the new opportunity. Chuck was passionate about coffee breaks. Problem solving abilities, works well with staff and clients. Clients and staff love Charlene. We can redesign how we handle our staff. 
Let me introduce Sharice Johnston. Sharice is former chair of the American Society of Interior Designers and now has a practice based in Cape Town, South Africa and Los Angeles. Sharice wrote to me about her experiences in taking on new roles in design. She wrote, I had to expend so much energy to hold my position without being walked over, albeit perhaps not intentionally, by clients as well as by my peers, subconsultants, and even my own team members. I can't tell you how many times men have tried to talk over me, appropriate my ideas as their own, and question my knowledge and undermine my authority. Cherise has a path forward. If we take women seriously, provide opportunities and the training and respect they deserve. Otherwise, our projects are not fulfilling their full potential and we're overlooking a huge talent pool. The third thing we can do is design better teams. Dr. Anita Woolley is professor at Carnegie Mellon University and an expert in collective intelligence. And her research demonstrates that teams who are the most effective with high levels of outcome are teams that are collectively intelligent, with a majority of team members being women. Turns out, the more women on the team, the better. In other words, we can't have too many women on our teams. Number four, design better discussions. Try recording a meeting and read the transcript and see who should have been in the meeting, who contributed, how, when, why did people contribute? Is someone talking over you? Hold up a sign. It works, have fun with things. Whatever vision you have, a few things need to change first. Number one, about 70 to 85% of public relations jobs are held by women, paid less than men. About 70% of HR jobs are held by women, paid less than men. 90% of Fortune 500 companies have CEOs who are men, paid more than anybody. So to summarize, it's men who make decisions which get a company in trouble and the women who are hired to clean up the mess. Hal, thank you very much for that. Don't know if you're still there, but um, yeah, when I saw the title Women Seriously, I was like, this could go one of two ways. Um, I'm, I'm glad you went the nice way. And th to be fair, so I've read two books that profoundly influenced my experience um, as a man in this world. One was Invisible Women, which you referenced, which is a fantastic book. The other one was Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret by Judy Bloom. I was in fourth grade. I wasn't ready, but it, it helped. Like... <laughs> It was good yeah. to know, you know. So thank you, Hal, very much. Welcome. That's right. And Dan is Dan is up in the booth. Is that the Dan you're talking to reach out to if they want to talk to you? Uh, they can reach out to me through LinkedIn. Perfect. Thank you, Hal, very much. Okay. Awesome. Our next presenter is Alec Pesta, class of 02 with a BARC and a presentation titled Building a Culture of Experience. Alex is a partner at City Architecture, an architecture and planning firm practicing in Cleveland, Ohio. Under his direction, the firm actively seeks out projects and initiatives that can rebuild neighborhoods or reactivate urban cores. Above all, he is charged to create space with purpose, City Architecture's core mission. This is most evident in his leadership and co-authoring for a Choice Neighborhoods Implementation Grant, where his work directly resulted in $45 million of HUD funding, one of five in the country, that launches over $500 million of investment to rebuild a public housing campus into a connected, mixed-income community where his firm's designs are currently under construction. He takes great pride in the relationships he has fostered with his team, clients, and the communities where he works. He also managed to pass enough tests that are more, there are more letters after his name than are in it. So there's that too. Please welcome to the stage, Alex Pesta. <laughs> Welcome. I don't want to eat up too much into my 10 minutes. I'm a little bit into my feelings today. Um, so if I get a little bit emotional, please bear with me. Um, my morning started off sitting in the back of an orientation and uh, UC tour with my daughter. Um, and so it's very trippy to be here, kind of where it all started. 
sharing that experience with Sophia and having her in the audience today. So um, above, and all, above and beyond all, I'm a dad and a husband. All right, so I want to just kind of put that out there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our work at City Architecture, our work in our communities and with the folks that we are pleasurable to do uh, that work with. Um, history is very much part of our culture. It is very much part of our architectural firm. However, I don't want to spend too much time talking about the history. I want to talk more about what we're doing right now and kind of where we are headed. Um, and I want to kind of plant that seed of where we are headed and kind of showing that through uh, how that has evolved over the time. One of the things that I share with my team uh, very often is that windshields are bigger than rear view mirrors. And I really believe that there is a reason for that. I am also an aspiring race car driver. Um, I need to talk to you. Yes. Um, uh, but uh, there are a reason that that is. So uh, kind of talking about where we've been, uh, where we are today, and where we're going. And just to cut to it, where we want to go is we want to change the narrative around what it means to practice uh, planning and architecture. Um, and we want to be the firm of choice. Uh, when folks think about where they want to work, when clients think about who they want to work with, when communities are looking for help, we want us to be on the top of their list. So um, I also uh, kind of take you back a little bit. Uh, when I was in fifth grade, when I was nine years old, I told my uh, fifth grade teacher that I was going to be an architect. Um, maybe because I had a slight crush on Mrs. Malone, but I really wanted to be an architect. Um, and so this really started this journey about uh, kind of who I was and what I was going to be. Um, I came to DAP, uh, met my lovely wife here, who is one of those 15% registered architects. So shout out to Tara, she did it all. Um, uh, and really fell in love with place through my experience uh, that was kind of afforded me through DAP, uh, through a travel quarter, and really got to see how people connect with place. And really how that really was more important to me than what the thing looked like. And it really started this lifelong journey on designing for experience. Um, from there, oops, from there, um, uh, I was honored. Uh, I was uh, asked, I was threatened uh, to become a partner at City Architecture uh, when the firm was 25 years old. Um, I was not 25 at that time. I am 25 in this picture. I have only worked at City Architecture my entire career. Um, and I'm standing uh, next to what would be one of my partners many, many years past the time that this photograph was taken. And I share that with you because at 25, I think as all designers, we think we know what we're going to do. We have an idea of what a career path is going to be. We have the idea of the type of work that we're going to do. And it all changes. And we have to approach it that way and understand that way. And in many ways, City Architecture was experiencing that as a 25-year-old firm. We were moving from a sole proprietorship, who was the founding partner, also a DAP alum, um, who was an amazing mentor to me. But the, ta the, the culture within the company was one way. It was a singular way. And we were put in a position, and we were given the opportunity to kind of swing that pendulum from my way to our way. And it was really fulfilling to work on the recalibration of how the firm does work in real time. So that collaboration, the fact that we were working together, we got to test what our way was in real time with real projects. Um, Brian mentioned the, the create space with purpose. This became our rallying cry. This is what we do every single day. This is what gets me out of bed. Um, our office is very collaborative in nature. It's one big open space. You'll see on the conference room door, um, it's one of our uh, core values, which is connect. Uh, those conference rooms are open to the public. This is a neighborhood group that uses our office uh, as a home base to have merchant meetings, resident meetings. This is a street captain's meeting uh, with our work in the partnership with the folks that live in Woodhill. It was very important for us to pull back the curtain on what it means to be an architect or a planner. Because the folks that we are lucky to work with, especially the youth when we have youth engagement uh, outreach, a lot of those folks don't know what architecture is. I was blessed at nine years old to know what that was, and our, I think part of our calling is to introduce that. So I'm going to go very quickly through some of our work, kind of reframing it back to that create space with purpose. Um, so obviously we create. Uh, the creation of space, this, was, uh, this is in Sandusky, Ohio. Uh, this is, was a 274 uh, car uh, parking lot that was on the water for all of you waterfront parking enthusiasts in the room. Um, this was there. I thought that it was going to be a really fun project and kind of easy to kind of move through the public space. 
However, I found out that people really do love to park in Sandusky, and I think we met all of the parking enthusiasts that live in the city of Sandusky. Um, the other thing that happens when um, folks at my firm is we kind of practice with a little bit of a chip on our shoulder, so if we hear, hey, that's a bad idea, um, we're gonna push back a little bit to understand why folks think that it's a bad idea. And what we kind of got to with Jackson Street Pier in Sandusky is it was a fear of change, and it was a fear of losing something that folks kind of identified as their own. And what we recognized is that the more conversations that we had in the public space, the better the design got, the better the outcome came. And a beautiful moment for us was when we presented the final design to the review board, folks showed up with t-shirts that were printed to support the initiative. And it was really meaningful to see that the initiative became more than the design, it became more than the thing, it became something that could galvanize the community. Folks were talking to each other about that thing but then they were also meeting about, hey, what do you love about Sandusky? What brought you here? What do you do for business? Who are your kids? How do we know each other? Um, and yes, the space is fantastic. So it did get built, by the way. Uh, it did win a, a handful of awards, um, including a great place in the state of Ohio through the American Planning Association. Um, and it is programmed very often. And in all of our, our materials that we share, we don't, we're not the typical architecture firm that shows a photograph of the space with nobody in it because who gives a shit? That's not how spaces are meant to be used. Um, so uh, yes, this works. Um, all of those things aside, this is the best part of this work for me and our team is that folks go to Jackson Street Pier, they share an experience. They might run into somebody that they haven't seen in years or they might meet somebody that they had no idea existed on the planet. And that is really, really fulfilling as a practitioner to think that the folks in this photograph didn't know that the other ones existed before they shared that experience on the pier. Um, space, um, what I will tell you this, I don't want to unpack this one too much, is that space, I think uh, DAP, uh, most design schools do a phenomenal job of having to design or helping us figure out how to design physical space. Our jobs as leaders is to find where the metaphorical spaces are and create that. It's there as important, if not more important. Um, find which voices are typically uh, excluded from process. Uh, identify the voices that might need help amplifying and be part of that ally, be part of that room. That's what we do uh, every single day. Um, like one of the previous presenters, uh, I draw everything. Um, our community engagement process is messy at best. Um, uh, and the way that we kind of explain that is have fun trying to create a relationship without getting a, a couple folks upset at you. That's just how it works. Um, so the with piece of this is really, really important and probably the most important part of our work. We know that this works because of the way that um, our community engagement has changed. So part of that pendulum swing was not so much fixating on what the final kind of design was, but getting out into the community and talking with folks and sharing the experiences of what it means to design together and actually handing somebody a pen and say, let's design this together. Let's figure out what a park looks like in your community or what it looks like for where you want to live or creating game boards for residents to kind of show off what they know and kind of collect information. And so understanding that we can change the narrative around community engagement there was really empowering and it was a really critical moment for us. Going back to Sandusky, it also gave us the confidence to say, hey, it's not just the four or five people that happen to speak the loudest that are going to be able to control this process. It's kind of inviting more um, voices into the narrative because the project gets a lot better that way. And it makes a lot of people uncomfortable. But that's also one of the best parts of this job. So um, I have built a program with one of my colleagues uh, that's called With Leadership. So we take that same approach, understanding that if we are working on a specific initiative, we only have influence over that one initiative. But if we can get into the city halls, if we can get into the council chambers, if we can get into the boardrooms and teach folks how to listen and think about things as a design problem rather than a CEO or a CFO, it really can change the policies of which, as an architect, I find myself fighting almost every single day, meaning the policies of zoning that are exclusionary by design or systematic racism that's just also all the way through the zoning codes. How can we get to the policies to change the way that this is work is done? I know that this works because at the firm, We've developed a series of uh, kind of lunch and learns uh, where we teach and learn from ourselves. Uh, so each one of these are, are sessions that um, I've done and I've created with our team. I call it the speaker series. And what we do is we just share. And I will tell you 
Just be ready to hear amazing things when you ask a team of 20 plus creatives, hey, what do you consider yourself an expert on? Because it's probably not architecture. But it's amazing what you can learn from someone if you listen. And so bringing that approach into all of that work. Finally, what I'll end is with purpose. Um, these are the best days at work, um, having these types of conversations. Um, and I get to do it every single day with an amazing team that doesn't look like the typical architecture and planning firm. Uh, and I, we do that very intentionally. Um, these folks are uh, allies for the neighborhoods in which we work with. Um, they are advocates and executioners of absolutely fantastic design. We have fun in our work. It doesn't have to feel like a punishment uh, to come to our work. So the last thought that, that I would leave you with um, is whatever your purpose is, whether if you knew it when you were nine years old or if you're still trying to figure it out, um, if you're designing uh, a new storefront, if you're designing new signage, if you're designing a graphics package, if you're directing a firm, whatever it is, is to deploy that purpose in a way that it is of service with others. And I truly, truly believe we can change the world when we do that together, absolutely can do that. So um, I started with, I wanted to talk about the future uh, and kind of where we're going. The God's honest truth is I don't know. Um, and I would be lying to you if I knew exactly what we were gonna do next. But what I do know is the spaces that we're invited into, we are gonna show up in force. The spaces that we're not invited into, we're still probably gonna show up in force. Um, because that's where the spaces are that need us the most. Um, and just thank you for the opportunity to share our story with, with the group. Uh, Shay, thank you to my team uh, at City Architecture. Uh, and thank you to everybody at DAP. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. I'll do that. I can't believe you swear in front of your kid. No. <laughs> you don't think she knows what yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that was a joke. Thank you for that, Alex. Yeah, uh, I'm going to find you later. We're going to talk race cars. Um, but, yeah, there was, whew, that was inspirational. Uh, our next speaker is the first person I met coming in today, uh, Matthew Spalletti. Cl he's our uh, class of 23. So when uh, we were talking about the range from before, this is last year. There you go, with his BSDE. His uh, presentation is entitled em Empathizing with Apathy. Uh, Matthew Spalletti is a recent DAP alumni graduating in 2023 with a BS in communication design. Be it through annual charity events like Swag Fest, you got me, I'm hooked already, safety awareness campaigns like Show Tools, or helping marginalized groups at UC through his work on identity inclusion with Lisa Barlow, Matthew is constantly looking for ways to improve the community around him through design. Please welcome to the stage, Matthew Spalletti. All right, so yes, I'm Matthew Spluddy. I am a 2023 DAP graduate. I am one of those people who does not know what they're doing yet, so bear with me here. Um, but I think as designers and people who are interested in design, empathy is something that we hear a lot about, and it's probably something that we're all a bit tired of hearing about. So what is empathy? Um, empathy is, was a big focus during my time at DAP, and it was, it was this focus on how do we create designs that really consider the needs of the users, and how do we make things that have more intention and kind of better the community and better the users at the end of the day. It's kind of why it's called communication design now and not graphic design, and why I still have to tell my dad that I'm not a communications major, because anyone can open up um, these programs, but not everyone can sit through 10 rounds of user testing. But at the end of the day, sometimes design can even invoke empathy from the users. But enough about empathy, let's go back to me, the reason we're all here. Can't spell empathy without me. Um, I, love, I love music. I'm a, I'm a DJ and a performer in the area. I love live music. I love going to support my friends. I love meeting new people. I love the culture that surrounds live music. And, and I love house shows so much. And for those who are unaware, house shows are just um, house parties that also feature live music in some capacity. So be it DJing or be it um, live bands performing. Um, it's, it's just a, a strong part of the last few years of my life and it's been so important to me. But since these are being thrown by college students, there are obviously a lot of issues um, and a lot of safety precautions that kind of get swept under the rug. So during my, my time in DAP for my capstone, I wanted to create something that could you know, remedy some of these issues and have an impact on the community that had done so much for me. And that would be something that would be so easy to do with a patient, open-minded, and 
uh, an audience that was willing to help those around them. Unfortunately, as mentioned, this is drunk college students. So they are notoriously annoyed, pretty apathetic, and have the mental capacity of a five-year-old. Um, luckily for me, though, I was working with the people hosting house shows, so it's a bit different. They're just kind of lazy, a little bit less apathetic, because it is their house at the end of the day, so they don't want it getting trashed. Um, but they are still um, drunk. Um, so, but luckily, they are invincible. They will never have any problems, and they will never die. So, so I have that going for me. But someone, someone at their house will have a problem eventually, and so I needed to think about, OK, how do we design something for these people? I have no idea. I don't know. Usually when you're designing something, it's with the intent of people wanting to use the design, or you're designing something in a way where they will be intentionally using it in some capacity. But this was not the case. Fortunately for me, though, this was a project that I chose because I was well immersed in the community, and these were people that I cared about, people that were smarter than me, people that had been doing this for a lot longer. So I went to them and I asked them, how, how can I help you? What can I do for you? So clearly, the problem would, would not be as big of an issue if the solution was easy. Um, there were a lot of things that, that they had shown me, that they had talked to me about. They, interviewing them give, gave me so much good information. It pointed me in the direction of other people who knew more and people who had tried things that I hadn't considered and resources that I had never heard about. Um, and they helped me send out surveys that I got even more diverse experiences and more people involved in this project and more ideas. And, with all of this information, everyone was telling me, okay, you have to actually do something now. Like, there was a clear evidence that people really cared about this and that people wanted something to be done. Um, so now that I had all this, this research and this information, it was time to, to do the fun part, do the designing part, um, the part that we all love a little more. Um, so how do you design something for this group of people? I also have no idea how to do that. So I decided to just jump in, meet them where they're at, um, and kind of walk a mile in their shoes. So this is my guide on how to design drunk. It is a step-by-step -step guide. You might want to take notes. This is probably something that you haven't experienced before, so probably going to be practicing this as of tomorrow. <laughs> Step one, you're going to want to buy a bunch of cheap beer. Um, I prefer Miller High Life, but anything light in the name too, Bud Light, Coors Light, any of that works too. Then you're going to want to drink it. We're not just looking at it. We are walking a mile in their shoes. We're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get drunk, and then we're going to make some really questionable designs. Um, there will be things that when you sober up, you will not remember making, but that's okay, because the last step here is to feed your children to the wolves. You want to show these designs to your friends who will be sober when they are reviewing them, and they will have a lot to say. Um, this is something that I've struggled with, um, and I think my time at DAP has really helped me get over it, because my designs are usually perfect, and there's never anything wrong with them. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to take criticism. Um, but it's so important to go to those people that your designs will be impacting and really ask them, because at the end of the day, design should be a collaborative process. It should be that you are kind of just acting as the hands. Let them be the brains. They're the ones experiencing it. They're the ones who know more than you. Um, so after taking my designs to a group of lazy, drunk, and generally apathetic people, aka my friends, I realized that there were some things that I had to do differently with my, with my system here. So my modular poster series that had scalable type at different sizes that could tear down got simplified. Oh, OK. Amber alert. Amber alert. We'll take a second here. <laughs> um, it became this, this set of print materials that were a bunch of different sizes for people to be able to pick from. Um, my visually interesting and unique design style became more of an intentional eyesore. And my contained print only um, easy digest easily digestible project got expanded to be a social awareness campaign. So breaking down those pivots one at a time, the first hurdle I had to overcome was people's laziness. It was a big day in studio for me when I realized that my set of three posters that were super high level conceptual would make a lot more sense as 26 print materials. Thank you, Marcus, for that. That was a very long night that night. But um, it's very important. it was a very important step for me to take because people didn't want, if people don't want to interact with your designs, you shouldn't be forcing them to do so. Um, don't give people more excuses than what they already have. It, it became a lot easier for people to just be able to look at a bunch of print materials and pick, OK, do I want the big one? Do I want the small one? What information do I want to be showing at my house? What issues am I facing at my personal house show? Um, I even went all the way down to business card size, which could be handed out so they could be the arbiter of that information at these shows. And then people could take this information and extend it beyond just the life of the house show. 
I had to step back a lot and ask people as well, where were those issues? Where were people able to make those excuses and to not want to interact with it or just be able to step away? And I had to address those issues. So one of those issues was cost. Um, these are college students, and we're talking about safety resources. They're not going to want to pay for it if they already don't want it in the first place. So I had to think about how could I get the cost as low as possible so that I could be giving this, these resources out for free. And so that's what I did. I was able to get the cost low enough that I had these pop-up events where I was handing out these safety resources for free, and people would just come and take what they needed. Um, and if you can't show up to a, one of those events, I, I made them high contrast black and white and all the printable sizes that you can print around campus with resources for, uh, on how to like download the stuff you need to print on campus and where you can go on campus to print. So I really, really t had a focus on minimizing those excuses for people. Probably also wondering by now about the design style having this, these like white borders in some spots. That was to to remedy the fact that people would be printing these on any printers and I wanted to make sure they look good on any printers so I designed them with these margins in mind um, knowing that they wouldn't be able to print full bleeds and they would still be able to look good. Next issue was dealing with people being drunk. Um, drunk people don't want to read and that's something I had to remind myself a lot as I was um, increasing the font size yet again and removing another line of text that I thought was super important to the project. Um, but if people don't want to read, don't make them. Sure, a visually interesting, unique design style is interesting and engaging, but sexual assault, as large as you can possibly put it, overflowing on an 18 by 24 inch poster is going to catch people's attention a lot more. I had to remind myself a lot that good design doesn't necessarily mean pretty design. It doesn't, like for this project, it didn't make a lot of sense to be making something that would be going on Pinterest. It made a lot more sense to be something that people would stop and say, oh shit, what is that? Um, and so that's just something I had to really keep in mind and something that, at the end of the day, you have to really consider your audience and what your goals are with your project. The last problem I had to face was people's natural apathy. Um, so I did what I could, and I met them where they go to be empathetic and where they go to you know, get away from that apathy, and that's Instagram. Sure, I'm posting how to be a better feminist ally on my Instagram story because I want to know and I, and I care about that, but I also want people to know that I care about that. So by extending this uh, project to a digital campaign, I was able to kind of spread the reach a lot further, and this allowed people to, who may not even be involved in the house show scene to learn about how to be safer in these environments and to post it on their stories and to share it with other people. And then more people are getting involved and more people are able to hear about these resources and put them at their house shows. And I was able to make posts that were video posts too. So I could make a, a video with a, a local band member and he could reach his audience and I could make tangential posts about how to print on campus and all sorts of other things that I couldn't necessarily include in those printed materials. So I had two semesters and a, oh, I've got to clear this amber alert. I had two semesters and a goal to create a tool that could help this scene that had done so much for me. And after a concerning number of all-nighters, countless trips back to the drawing board, a few too many drunk designing sessions, and endless pages of feedback from my peers that was some of the most helpful feedback I've ever received, I was able to go to house shows and see my resources being used by people actually there. At the beginning of this project, I had no idea how to make a drunk 18-year-old college student care about what to do if someone at his neighbor's house show was potentially overdosing, but by the end I realized it's the same thing you have to do for any design project. You have to go to the people who your design will be affecting and ask them. Thank you. Matthew, that was profound uh, and hilarious, but on very touchy subject too. So well done, nice balance. Um, and it doesn't have to be pretty to be good. I like that. There was something I know. I'm paraphrasing terribly. I think Jonas Salk, the inventor of the polio vaccine, said, um, "You don't you don't perseverate on the answer. Find the right questions, and the answer will reveal itself." So your "I don't know" thing vibes with that pretty well. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Matthew. Our next presenter is Megan Mays, class of 2008, uh, BSDE, with a pre presentation, Agile Revolution, Embracing Product Gems for Simplicity and Success. Megan has worked in product design and development for almost 20 years. She began in the fashion industry as a designer for Oshkosh Bagash. I wore those. Abercrombie and totes. I didn't wear that. Uh, totes Isotoner before transitioning to work on SAS. Pro is it SAS? SAS product development, thank you. Megan has a passion for building great products that people love. Please welcome to the stage, Megan Mays. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. I'm really excited about the opportunity to be here. I just love DAP and I love hearing everyone. Um, so feeling very inspired. Um, 
just quickly, uh, I thought I'd share a little bit about my background. Um, kind of interesting. So I say I've gone from soft goods to software. Um, so a little bit of a journey, but started here in DAP. Uh, graduated in 08. Um, right away started working at, in cold weather accessories. Um, just some, some highlights from my career so far. Uh, and a lot of problems I've solved along the way. I've found that sort of my reoccurring theme uh, as I apply you know, to new places and continue to kind of move into different areas uh, of product design and development. Um, we were the first group to take the smart touch glove to market. If you remember back then, um, when you go to pump gas or use an ATM, you actually had to take your gloves off um, to use the touch screen. So tech wasn't really up to par yet with you know, the accessories we were wearing. So that was just kind of a cool highlight from my time there. Um, I moved into software development really focused on real estate tech, um, which is interesting. There's a lot of that, and it's constantly a growing field. Um, but a lot of cool things along the way. I've, I've launched an AI assistant um, into the market. I've won a W3 award for best business app. Uh, and I'm currently working in CRM, um, which is customer relationship management. So it's all about your contacts and building relationships and nurturing relationships um, still in the real estate space. So today I thought I'd talk a little bit about what is Agile? What does that mean? How is it applied? Um, Agile's kind of spicy. If you can be spicy in product development, it's kind of spicy. Um, you could ask 100 people, what does Agile mean to you? And you would get 100 different answers, um, which I love. Uh, it's, it's kind of a great topic for debate and discussion. But what I think is great to remember about it uh, and applied across all of our professions, uh, it's a mindset, right? It's about understanding, collaborating, uh, learning, staying flexible, um, all with in mind trying to achieve you know, high performing results. Um, I love working on an Agile team today. Uh, they can deliver you know, instant, intimate, frictionless value at scale, which is a very powerful uh, statement. Um, and people who practitioner, practitioners of Agile mindsets, uh, focus on innovating, right? And delivering, um, I would say, more steady value to customers uh, at a rapid response, uh, and they're able to shift. So it's kind of an interesting thing when you look at the marketplace um, and SaaS products and, and how customers and all these things can shift, and you need to kind of be flexible with that in your product development. And, and typically, teams work in two-week sprints. I'm not the biggest fan of a, a sprint time box, but it is typical across Agile teams, uh, which will come into play a little bit later. Um, this, although not a cute example, um, it is a powerful slide. I, I use this. Uh, this is old. It's a year old, um, and things are blurred out, obviously, for, for confidentiality reasons. But um, it was a product I, I worked on about a year ago. Um, and I, I like using this type of slide when I'm communicating uh, with stakeholders, right? So people within a company, just to kind of illustrate, uh, Road mapping is hard, product development is hard. Uh, as a product manager, I can be sometimes spinning eight to nine plates uh, you know, at one time of uh, features, development, stuff that's in testing, stuff that's in sprint under, under development with our engineers, uh, getting ready to launch, or also in R&D, right? So features and ideas uh, that we're shaping as a product and engineering team. So there's sort of always a lot happening, um, but I like to use this slide to really illustrate uh, a question that I was asking myself a lot, uh, staring at this every two weeks when I would cover, you know, here's what we have going on, here's what's coming up, here's what we're ready to release, um, you know, to the business and to the stakeholders. I asked myself, uh, almost every time we met, how often is value actually being delivered to the users of this product? So as you'll see on my blurry sort of sample, um, some of these line items are, are features that maybe would take a week or two, maybe a couple sprints, um, but some could take four sprints, you know? Some could take six months to develop, uh, depending on you know, the initiatives of the company or you know, the feature that we're trying to, to build and, and release. So um, for me, it was really important to look at this timeline and in the, in the mind of a user of an application, you know, are they seeing that we're delivering constant value to them? There's always this sort of crave for more um, you know, with our audience in, in most apps today, um, where they wanna be able to know that you're actually constantly providing them value and constantly thinking about innovation um, so, as any you know, designer or, or product manager, product person, um, I started to think about the problem, right? So this was the problem statement uh, that I came up with, right? Our roadmap was full, as you could see, right? A lot going on. Uh, we were aligned with the business and the strategic objectives, which is always sort of a, a big piece that you want to make sure you have covered on your roadmap and your planning. Um, but customers weren't seeing delivery, right? They weren't seeing these improvements. They weren't seeing enhancements due to a lot of big initiatives, um, which I think is a pretty common problem. So you know, the question that my team and I were asking ourselves is, was there a way to inject some big impact features right, um, with small development timelines uh, into our existing plans? We didn't want to disrupt the roadmap. We had committed 
to these line items, you know, to the business, uh, to the executives, you know, to, to deliver these things in a certain amount of time. And so we came up with the GEMS, uh, which is a really fun way uh, to look at a new framework. Um, I think GEMS are amazing because they can be applied really across any discipline, right? Um, the idea behind calling it a product GEM is because my team and I were literally mining through data, you know, product feedback, um, customer testimonials, ideas I had written down while using products of, of ways to improve them. Um, you know, so we came up with this set of rules. So these were our three must-haves to be a product gem. Uh, it must be a low effort ad, achievable in one sprint, right? So not a lot of time can be invested to not disrupt the commitments we'd made to the business on our roadmap and our deliverables. Um, number two was it had to bring delight or value to the user. So it had to be something they liked using, right? It had to be something that they were kind of awed by, right? Um, that sort of little sparkly thing that got their attention in the product to make them happy using the product. Uh, and number three, must have simple requirements and acceptance criteria. I have written thousands of user stories that are just way too long and that should never be introduced to a developer. Um, you know, so it really needed to be simple, a few sentences to really capture what we were trying to do in the product um, to make it delight the user. So this was our product framework. Um, and I wanted to walk you through just one example of one that we actually implemented, uh, just to give you a better idea visually of what that actually means. Um, so we called this Add a Contact Anywhere. And remember, I was working on CRMs at this point, so uh, you know, a software application that's fully dedicated to managing relationships between a user and their contact system. Um, so we had some really great feedback, right? We were mining for gems. We were finding all this actual user pain points, um, and this just was a great one that fit into this category. Um, so the user said, I need an easier way to add a new contact, right? Um, especially when I'm on the phone and I don't want to click around to find it. So they're on the phone. Again, we're, on real, we're talking about real estate agents, right? They're mobile, um, they're meeting a lot of people, and they want to get someone into their database quickly, right? Um, the, the product that we had in front of them had a three-click process to adding a contact, which you would think is close to the number one thing they're doing in our system, right? Um, so we thought about this, we had this great pain point, um, we had this functionality already in our product, so we just leveraged it. So we took existing functionality, we surfaced it in a new way, not to distract from the way they already know, um, in a new way, uh, and it took less than a few days to implement, so no impact to our roadmap, right? We weren't swaying from any of the deliverables, um, we could keep our commitments to the business, uh, and the great thing, the outcome of this, we had an in-product um, like notification pop-up when we released new things that we would push out to users. Um, and when we released this feature, again, little tiny gem, uh, we saw an increase of 98% satisfaction um, just in, in engaging with that little pop-up. You know, people were like, cool, awesome, this is amazing. This has solved a huge pain point. Um, I thought this was just kind of funny because it's really hard to see. CRMs have a lot of information, but you know, this is before and after. Can you tell the difference? Probably not, um, but that's okay. Um, gems are in no way needed to be big or small. Visually, there's no requirement around that. But here it is, this tiny little icon. Um, and we put this everywhere, right? So this is the add a contact icon. We put it on every screen uh, within the application. So no longer was it buried under you know, a, a left side nav with a series of clicks. It was everywhere. So no matter what the user was doing in the product, um, they could now add a contact at any time, right? So it saved them a lot of time, a lot of energy. They didn't have to go find it. Um, you know, the perfect product gem. This is not my product gem, but I thought this was probably more memorable than an add a contact icon in a CRM. Um, so I'll close with just, I thought, a fascinating story. This is quite old, uh, probably over a decade old, but it's called the $300 million button. Um, and I think this is such a great example of a potential gem. I don't work on this team, um, but there was a very famous e-commerce company, and we've all experienced this today, which is why I kind of love this. They, they revolutionized um, the way that the, the checkout experience is, so um, they, originally had a button in their checkout flow, um, and it said, don't have an account, click here to register. Uh, and it terrified everybody. Um, so there was this huge sort of uh, barrier for conversion, right? Nobody wanted to make an account. They didn't want to have to put their information in or commit to something, right? So they had all this, you know, customers abandoning and um, you know, people having multiple uh, logins, multiple passwords, um, and they made a really simple change, a UX change. They changed the language on their button, which you know, I've seen this everywhere, um, so they were definitely the trend starters. They changed the register button to continue as guest, um, which is now on every online you know, e-commerce site, um, and it was staggering. So with this tiny, simple language change on a button, um, 45% increase in sales, an additional $15 million their first month, and $300 million within a year. So they had all these barriers lifted um, for you know, users now being able to completely move through. 
which I just think is just amazing. Um, and in conclusion, just a reminder, right, small changes can have big impact. Um, delivering incremental value alongside larger initiatives, uh, I think, is a great way to go. Uh, and I encourage everyone just to find creative ways um, to consistently deliver value to your users. Thank you very much. Sometimes it's the simple things that have the big impact, right? Thank you, Megan, very much. Um, our final presenter of the evening, if, if uh, Matthew was our newest graduate, this was one of our earlier graduates, uh, Don Jacobs, class of 1967, on a case study for winery tasting room. Uh, Jacobs graduated in 1967 from UC and started his career in the offices of SOM in San Francisco. He started designing homes at the Sea Ranch in 1969 and moved there to full-time in 1970 after receiving his architectural license. Jacobs is the recipient of dozens of awards for his professional work and dedication to community service. While at the Sea Ranch, uh, he was an active member of the volunteer fire department for 14 years. He served as design committee chairman from 1974 to 78. Jacobs has designed over 100 custom homes there and won 27 local and national awards. In 2008, Jacobs and his wife, Julie Brinkeroff Jacobs, were inducted into the Building Industry Association's Hall of Fame. Jacobs received his fellowship in the AIA in 2009. 2018 brought his award from UC School of Design, Architecture, Art, and Planning as Alumnus of the Year. In 2022, Jacobs received the Distinguished Architect excuse me, Distinguished Architect Award from the Sea Ranch Association for his body of work at the Sea Ranch. Please welcome to the stage, Don Jacobs. Thank you, let me get you started here. Greetings everyone. Uh, it's a, it is an honor to be here. Wow, what great presentations. Uh, I hope I can, mine will live up to it. And by the way, I should say before I start the presentation, that I'm the same age as President Biden. So if I stumble or forget something, don't worry about it, I'll probably remember it later. So, <laughs> so with that, let's look at what does this beautiful oak tree, 80 feet in diameter, and uh, about 150 years old, oldest thing on the site we're talking about, the Casino Mine Ranch, a bottle of wine, and this four acre pond all have in common. Well, these are the things I was presented with when I was uh, first taken on the site by the client. <clears throat> and this was my inspiration. It sat above the pond uh, by itself, and I just kept thinking, how can I work this into the design? Because it's a, such a strategic location. The program was pretty straightforward. About a 3,000 square foot uh, tasting room. The location, uh, this is not Napa or Sonoma, by the way. <laughs> this is a, a much more rural agricultural area in the foothills of the Sierra, uh, also known as the Gold Countries, where it was discovered by the 49ers uh, not far away. About an hour's drive east of Sacramento called the Shenandoah Valley. There are about 30 wineries in the valley, and the architectural style could best be described as rustic. Well, my client uh, has been producing for about 10 or 12 years very sophisticated wines, so we wanted a more sophisticated uh, building, uh, tasting room, to accommodate people making reservations uh, for their uh, to taste the wine. Here is the site. Uh, I apologize f uh, to those uh, virtually watching because I know the, uh, my marker won't show up, but uh, the pond is obvious. The tree sits just above it that I had the earlier picture of. So you can see it's in a strategic location. Now it looks flat, but it's not because from the water, just Above the water is a flat area where we made the um, event lawn. And then it slowly rises up in sort of an S shape in the land to 
a plateau where <clears throat> the tree sits. So that all worked very well and was kind of my second inspiration. So once I started spending time on the site, taking all these things into consideration, I realized that I had to have the building embrace that tree some way. So I put the entry next to the tree. And then I started doing uh, more drawings, more sketches. Here we have the uh, 10 feet of glass, 60 feet long, that opens to a grand terrace. And I used this S shape of the land to reflect in the ceiling. <clears throat> this is uh, a wall 10 feet high, rammed earth wall, two feet wide, 60 feet long, goes from the outside of the entry through the building and separates the wine tasting area here in the Grand Terrace from the other functions. A floor plan, you can see the angled wall. <laughs> this was interesting because I was, in order to do what I wanted to do inside and outside, I was struggling with whether that should be 10 degrees, 15 degrees, 20 degrees. And I went to uh, a AIA conference in Scottsdale and I think for the fifth time, we went to Taliesin West. The guide said, well, Frank Lloyd Wright only used 15 degrees. So I had my answer. <laughs> and it worked. It, was, uh, it did what I wanted it to do. I should say also on the <clears throat> rammed earth wall that uh, the client, that was my attempt at what the client wanted, which was one of the few really uh, requirements was to work the color of the soil into the design because the soil is uh, decomposed granite, lots of rocks uh, on the site. It goes from a um, brownish uh, color chocolate, milk chocolate, to a dark rustic uh, reddish brown color. So those, how does an architect work those colors into the design? Well, that was one of the challenges. Now for the landscape architect, that was easy because they could just place rocks around, <laughs> which they did. And I should say the, <laughs> uh, truth be known here, the uh, landscape architect was my wife's firm, uh, Lifescapes International. She just retired from controlling that firm uh, a few months ago. But they were a great team to work with. Um, we managed to work out the driveways, the entry, the parking, and all of that. And you have to remember, <clears throat> when you're designing in a vineyard, the vine vineyard manager doesn't want anything on the land other than the vines. So <laughs> every time you put something down, you're taking away from what he wants there. So that was a compromise. but envisioning the project being in the vineyard um, was uh, again one of the inspirations and uh, I have to say a word about models. I don't think a designer can learn uh, more about their design than when they're building a model. 3D renderings are wonderful, they do everything they're supposed to do but when you've got your hands into it and you can hold it up and, and cut it and make adjustments. Thank goodness, <laughs> while I was here, I learned how to build models. And uh, I still love doing it. And I noticed in <clears throat> visiting the studios yesterday that that art has expanded and, and grown. And, and there's a lot of people doing very creative models here, um, which is great to see, because I'm a firm believer in them. Uh, being a sole proprietor, not having a large firm like I used to, um, <laughs> I had to do everything, like checking shop drawings. Well, think about it. You're, you're entrusting your design to a draftsman in a steel manufacturing plant to interpret it into something that will work when it's out there in the field. <laughs> uh, scary. So probably 
eight different times and had to go back to the, to the um, uh, shop with the, with the drawings. No, this doesn't work. What about this? What about that? And I was literally um, sweating bullets when this steel went up, hoping it would all be in the right place. <laughs> and fortunately, it was. But uh, it's also a great experience as an architect to watch this phase of, of the uh, construction, at least it is for me. Um, construction shot, the tree in its winter mode. Uh, I, I refer to this as the Tim Burton mode because it looks like something <laughs> he would come up with. It's still a beautiful tree, uh, even in that mode. Uh, here's one. A shot taken from inside the tasting room looking out to the Grand Terrace, which is mud now, and onto the uh, pond and the trees surrounding it. The, the pond has a resident egret, a resident heron, Canadian geese fly in and out. There's a resident duck population. It's a, a beautiful thing to watch. And here's the end product, uh, the tree on the left, the entry, um, on the right, the landscaping. Uh, this is about nine months after, <clears throat> excuse me, the project was, was completed. Now inside, here's how I handled the colors. Um, and if anybody is ever considering a rammed earth wall, please contact me because <laughs> I've done a lot of research and most of what you see on the internet is not true at all. It doesn't work that way, <laughs> believe me. It's not inexpensive, it's not something that can be done by um, inexperienced labor. Anyway, I could go on and on, but I won't. So this is almost a, a rammed earth wall, but these are the colors in the soil outside. Now one of the things I was <laughs> happy to be able to do and surprised the owner because he didn't realize it until I did it until he was finished is that on the right hand side where the uh, you you walk up to the receptionist here and the the, <clears throat> the wine tasting is by uh, reservation and you check in and you are looking through the building to the fire in the fireplace at the pizza oven uh, that's cooking your pizza to go with the, with the wine that you're about to taste. Uh, I didn't like the idea of the dome shape. I didn't think it was gonna, it would, I thought it would distract from everything else. So I just wrapped the pizza oven in, in Corten steel. That was my, an my answer to handling that. Uh, a shot from the Grand Terrace looking back at the tree in the, in, in the interior. And my, one of my favorite shots, finally, my inspiration, framing the tasting room and the entry. Thank you. I like the Corbusier glasses, too. It, it goes with the vibe. That's nice. Thank you, Don, for that uh, inspiring project to close us out. Um, and thank you for your presentation. I'd like to, this has been another great NAPEX. Thank you everyone for coming. I'd like to do a special thank you to some people behind the scenes. Thank you, Don up in the, Dan up in the booth. And thank you very much. Thank you for Ellen and your team for putting this all together. And if you would, one more round of applause for all of our guest speakers today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. I'm looking forward to what happens next year. Um, thank you for joining us. You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Bye.